What's up designers and welcome back to Rempton Games. Let's talk about Spore, the 2008 life simulation strategy game by Maxis Studios and game designer Will Wright. In Spore, the players can guide the evolution of a species from a single-celled organism to a galactic civilization, but the part of the game that stands out to me, and I think most players, is the creature creator. Spore's creature editor actually lets players craft custom creatures that they can control as playable characters in the game. But how does any of this actually work? Let's find out by looking at the modeling, texturing, and animation of the player-created creatures in Spore. get started, some of you may have noticed that it's been a while since I've posted on this channel. That's because a lot has happened while I've been working on this video. I've moved to a new apartment, got COVID, discovered a blood clot in my lungs, and had a minor existential crisis. Basically, it was really difficult to get this video made, so if you could leave a like, or subscribe, or a comment on this video, or even share it with somebody else, I would really appreciate it, and it would mean a lot. Without further ado, let's get started. First, let's take a look at the modeling. The creature creator lets players design and create all kinds of different creatures, from a simple worm to an incredibly complex, realistic creature with hundreds of different components. Getting this to work was a challenge, both from a game design perspective and a technical one. From a game design perspective, the designers had to find a balance between two extremes. On the one hand, they could have simply shipped the game with a full-blown 3D animation pipeline like Blender or Maya and let the players create literally whatever they could think of. However, anyone who's used these types of tools could tell you that they have a pretty steep learning curve and most players aren't professional 3D modelers. The other extreme would simply be to use pre-made, artist-created models, which is what most games do. The challenge was to find an interface that would allow players with no prior experience to create reasonable looking creatures while still allowing a huge range of possible designs. This challenge was accomplished in two main ways, using metaballs and rig blocks. So what is a metaball? They're basically these 3D gloopy balls that stick together when they get close to each other. Metaballs are interesting because they work differently than most 3D models do. Your basic 3D model is what's called a mesh, which is a collection of points in 3D space all connected by edges. Metaballs, on the other hand, are what is called an implicit surface, which means they're actually defined by a mathematical function rather than a set of points in space. While I won't go into all the technical details here, the basic idea is that each metaball has a function that defines the surface of that model. And when the metaball is by itself, that function creates a sphere. But when you bring two metaballs close together, their two functions get added together, which means that their two surfaces combine into one. In the Spore Creature Editor, metaballs are used for the main body and limbs of the character. As you stretch the spine or the limbs, more metaballs get added to ensure a smooth, continuous surface, and you can also grow or shrink individual metaballs to make different parts of the body fatter or thinner. While metaballs are good at defining the general shape and structure of the creature, the more complicated pieces, like the mouths, hands, spikes, etc., were created using rig blocks. A rig block is an individual handcrafted body part that can be snapped onto the creature. And each rig block has a set of degrees of freedoms that players can control by pulling these different handles that let the rig block be scaled, stretched, or transformed in predefined ways. By combining these two systems, Spore struck a good balance between open-ended player creativity and high-quality artist-made assets that ensured that even the most inexperienced player could create something that looks cool and works well within the game system. This combination had a number of other benefits as well. It guaranteed that the creature would work well with the game's animation system, which we'll talk about later in the video, and it also made it so that the creature could be stored in a much smaller amount of data than a traditional 3D mesh, 
which meant that creatures could easily be shared back and forth between different copies of the game or to the Sporepedia. Now that we've modeled our creatures, it's time to texture it. This typically consists of two steps. The first is converting the 3D surface of the creature into a 2D plane, and then painting your textures on top of that plane. The first step is called UV unwrapping, and it's basically witchcraft. If you've ever seen the many, many kinds of map projections that exist, you know how complicated it is to unwrap a simple 3D sphere onto a flat surface without introducing all kinds of distortions. And most 3D models are way more complicated than a sphere. UV unwrapping is a really complicated, time-consuming, and tedious process that typically takes a skilled artist hours or even days for a sufficiently complicated 3D model. And Spore has to do it in the background, on the fly, for an arbitrary user-generated creature. Luckily, Spore has an advantage that most texture artists don't. Nobody but the computer ever has to actually see or use the UV map that the game creates. Part of the difficulty of creating a usable UV map is that an actual human artist has to use that map to texture the creature, which means that they need to pretty easily be able to associate different parts of the map with different parts of the creature. Or doesn't have this limitation, so its only goal is to unwrap the model in such a way that it lies flat with minimal distortion. A much more achievable task. It basically does this by selecting a random face on the surface of the model, and then grouping together with other faces that are pointing in roughly the same direction. It then repeats this process until every face on the surface of the model has been selected. This results in a very rough and ugly, but usable, UV map. The next step is to actually apply textures to these maps. The first solution was to basically give the players a virtual paintbrush that they could use to paint on the surface of the creature. And as they move the brush around the surface of the model, the game would automatically translate that location on the model with the corresponding location on the UV map and color it in. This method worked, but was considered to be too complicated. It took a lot of effort and skill to get good results, and they figured most players wouldn't want to completely repaint the surface of their creature manually every time they wanted to change its color so they decided to find a way to make the process more automatic. The solution they came up with is a little strange, but clever. Instead of having the players manually move a paintbrush over the surface of the creature, they programmed particles to move on the surface of the creature, basically painting as they go. Because the particles are moving on the model's surface, this guaranteed that the textures would be continuous, and they could program the particles to move in all sorts of different ways to create spots, stripes, and other patterns. In the final game, the players are able to customize the creature's texture by applying three different layers of pattern. A base coat, a main pattern, and a detail layer. Each layer has a corresponding set of particle painters, which all combine together to form the creature's overall texture. Now that we have a fully modeled and painted creature, the final step is to animate it. Traditionally, 3D animation can be done in one of two main ways. The first is through motion capture, where you have a real-life object or creature perform a motion and then feed that data into the computer, or hand animation, where an artist painstakingly moves the 3D model into different poses to create the motion that they want to animate. Both of these methods require the artist to have access to a 3D model ahead of time in order to animate it, and because the creature models don't exist until the player creates them, neither method is applicable. Instead, the developers had to figure out a way of creating animations one time that could then be applied to an infinite range of different creatures. The animation system is pretty complicated, so I think the best way to describe it would be through an example. Suppose you wanted to create a dancing animation where your creature would stomp its feet and wave its hands in the air. Traditionally, you would simply, you know, select a hand, move it into a waving motion, select the feet so that they stomp, right? The problem is 
this only applies to one creature and we need to generalize this animation in such a way that it can apply to a wide range of creatures. To do this, the first thing we have to do is break the animation into different parts. In this case, one part for the waving arms and another part for the stomping feet. These parts are called channels. For each channel, you then have to specify what body parts the animation is going to apply to. For example, when it comes to your hand waving animation, you don't know what the creature is going to look like, how many hands it's going to have, or even if it's going to have hands at all. So you need to be very specific when you're writing your query about what this animation is actually going to apply to. Do you want it to apply to all the hands on one side? Do you only want to, to apply to the lowest pair of hands? You gotta be specific. For this example, suppose that we want the highest pair of hands to wave, and we want all of the feet to stomp, left first and then right. We have to specify that in our queries. Once you've broken your animation into channels and used queries to select the body parts you want to animate, the process is actually pretty similar to a traditional 3D animation. The artist moves the body parts between different poses, and then the animation system animates the creature between those poses. After you've animated the motion, however, you have to tell the system how to generalize that motion. For example, your foot stomping animations might be marked as ground relative, so that each foot on a side hits the ground at the exact same time, no matter how long the legs are. On the other hand, you might specify that your arm waving motion is scaled based on the length of the limb, so that longer limbs have a bigger motion than smaller ones. These sorts of instructions help your specific animations generalize to a wide range of creatures while still looking pretty natural. Overall, the system is a bit of a mix between traditional hand animation and programming. You still have to manually animate the different motions, but then you use programming code to tell the system how to apply the animations to different creatures. This describes the main animation system, but there are some special edge cases. For example, some animations are branched, which means that the game has multiple different animations it could use and has to decide which to use in a particular situation. An example is grabbing an object. If the creature has graspers, then it's going to select one of those graspers to reach out and grab the object. If it doesn't, then it's going to use a different animation to grab the object with the creature's mouth. There's also a secondary animation system called Jiggles, that applies physics-based animations to parts of the creature that aren't actively being animated. For example, suppose your creature has a really long tail. While your creature is running, that tail might naturally bob up and down, creating a greater sense of realism. Finally, there's a specialized animation system for the creature's gait or walk cycle, which groups together legs based on length, and assigns an appropriate animation and speed for each group of legs. Add all of these steps together, the modeling, texturing, and animation, and you have a fully functional, completely custom player-created character. Of course, Spore is a very interesting and complicated game, and I was only really able to scratch the surface in this video, so if you have any questions or there are any additional topics you'd like me to explain in more detail, please let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss more videos like this in the future. And join me next time for the next entry in my TCG Design Academy series. Until then, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.